and happy Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> and uh, as far as announcements, uh, he is risen. No, can't imagine the joy of that that first Resurrection Sunday when it finally dawned on them. You know, I just can't put the pieces together. <clears throat> But uh, still that same joy today. Uh, we have a snack at the end of the month. We still have no theme for the snack, but we may eventually. Food? Did I hear someone say food? Um, I thought we had a... Yeah, I said subs. Yeah. Oh, subs! You know, I didn't write it down. Well, good. I'll come up with another one. subs and ice cream. Yes! Perfect. It's perfect because I was at Walmart this week. I'm at Walmart every week, of course, because that's grocery shopping, all these Walmart. And uh, I always check the end cap for clearance. And uh, the end cap had clearance ice cream. What type of Walmart or ice cream does Walmart get rid of on clearance? Rainbow unicorn ice cream. It is apparently birthday cake flavored ice cream with sparkly purple veins running. It's like rainbow colored, but there's a sparkly purple vein going through it. And I thought, I have no idea how this is, but I'm sure there is a bunch of kids that will love this. And some of us adults will have a small taste of it and go, I'm really not sure I need to have any more of that. And some adults will probably look at it and go, not in a million years will I even taste that. Wow. Yeah, it, like it, that was the script. There was nothing dairy, milk, cream, nothing on the, well, in the description of it. Well, these it looked like a, like a, like a nice crunch bar type thing. With white something in the middle of no chocolate and crunches on it. But they, they didn't even try to say on the box. So it was on the box. There was no cream listed or ice. You know. It was artificially flavored frozen dessert. Well, I'd say these were half-gallon containers, but we all know there's no half-gallon containers. They're like... Mm -mm. This, this may be what we say about rainbow unicorn ice cream. And this is saying a lot because he ate his whole piece of lime meringue pie that was horrifically bitter lime. He ate all of that, but he won't eat all of this ice cream. That is something. Well, I, I got this rainbow ice cream, unicorn ice cream, whatever, this week, and I thought, I don't care what the theme is next month. We're having this. We already have the theme, subs and ice cream. And so if you want normal ice cream, you might want to bring some normal ice cream. If you think rainbow unicorn ice cream sounds great and birthday cake flavored ice cream sounds great, then I've got the, I only got four of them. So limited availability. Um, everyone that wants some may have a whole bucket to themselves. As far as the subs go, we're bringing sub fixes. We can make our own, right? I will put a sign up sheet out next okay. week because subs is one of those things that if everyone decides to bring bread, <laughs> makes for an interesting night if everyone decides to bring ham you know if everyone oh everyone just decides they're going to bring sliced cheese all of a sudden we don't have subs we have a cheese plate so we, <laughs> i'm trying to think well if we all brought shredded lettuce then we might need a little bit of salad dressing from next door to make that the peanut butter and jelly with bacon
grape and pork go really well together, I would I would be all over that. That would be good. That'd be tasty. I wouldn't eat the whole thing. I don't I don't know how we got here from Resurrection Sunday, but we did. Uh, as far as prayer and praise items, the Becky in the bulletin is not this Becky, but a Becky that's the sister of a co-worker at the tax office that's having surgery on an aneurysm this week. Mike has a praise this week that he was knocked halfway across the parking lot at work and uh, his arm is all bruised up, and that's a praise because that's better than getting hit in the head with what he got hit in the arm with. And uh, he can tell the story far, far better about what happened and what was involved in that. But uh, certainly praising the Lord that he flinched in exactly the right way to only get knocked nearly unconscious. It was <laughs> That one's not getting added to uh, Six Flags anytime soon as, as a ride. Uh, and continue to pray for the McClendon family. Terry's father's funeral was yesterday, and uh, they would appreciate prayers. Uh, I think we mentioned Asher Cole, was it last Sunday or Wednesday. Wednesday night? Was in the hospital with pneumonia, and it was something similar to RSV, but he's back home now and doing well. So praise from the Cole family as well. Uh, but some things to keep in mind uh, as we pray throughout the week. And uh, Mike, it is good to have you with us this morning. Would you open us in a word of prayer? Father, we would like to just take a moment to extend our gratitude for the opportunity to be in your house today on, on this Easter Sunday. And we just ask that you would help each one of us to have our hearts and minds open to the message that you laid on the pastor's heart to apply to our lives and help us to each one while you're being a better servant of yours throughout the week. We're grateful for the week one you've given us to nice forecast we have for this upcoming week, springtime hitting here. We just uh, ask your guidance direction over all that's said and done. For the prayer requests that we have mentioned here, uh, I'd be from the tax office sister, the uh, sister that the, the co-worker, just ask that you guide the direction in her medical issues there and think that she's dealing with it. Once again, just ask that uh, all things said and done here today would honor and glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Take our hymnals and stand. 217. Christ the Lord is risen today. 217. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Thank you. you. May be seated. Go to 227. Thine is the glory. 227. And the 220, he lives. Jesus lives today. He 
waltzed with me and tossed with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, so and sing eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King oh, of all who seek him the help of all who find none other is so loving so good and kind he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along the narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him born. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Okay, if you stand for the scripture reading today from Matthew 28, and we'll do a reference to the beginning of the ending. Matthew 28, 1 through 6. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Matthew 28, 1 through 6. Thank you, Macy. And for the children worried, you're being dismissed after the offering this morning to Junior Church, just in case anyone was a little worried or concerned. Let's pray as we take up our offering this morning. Father, we do thank you this morning for your goodness to us. We're thankful for the power of the resurrection, that death could not hold Jesus, the stone could not hold Jesus in. But Father, we're thankful that uh, that resurrection power gives a promise of future resurrection for those who put their faith and trust in you as well. We do pray as we worship this morning that we would do so with hearts of gladness. And as we give back to you a portion of what you've blessed us with, that you would take it and use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, name that offertory. Joyful, joyful, and crown them with many crowns? Yeah. Okay. The medleys are the hard ones. What's that? <laughs> Little devil went down to Georgia. I don't think there's fire coming out of the uh, coming out of his uh, bow. Is fire coming out of the bow? Yeah. Charlie Daniels. Yeah. Oh. Well, we're going to start off this morning in Matthew chapter 28, where we had our scripture reading. You have to realize we didn't think about the sound on that, so I don't know if the uh, online stream picked up the violin very well. It should. It was close to this microphone. This one picks up pretty well. Matthew chapter 28, where we're starting off the power of the resurrection. Uh, and our main idea today is that the power of the resurrection provides power for believers today. Uh, sometimes we think of the resurrection as, as just a past fact, something that happened. Sometimes we think of the resurrection... Uh, just in terms of, of what Jesus did, and it's one and done. Uh, and then as we come to the Easter season, we get so distracted with everything else. I was actually kind of surprised this year that I don't think Aldi's had flowers like in the front of their store. Normally they've got the Easter lilies and the tulips, and they didn't have any for sale this year. And I thought, uh-oh, something going on in the greenhouse world. With... Not that we know of. But uh, you could tell at Walmart because the baskets of uh, pastel, the pastel colored baskets of candy and toys have been lining the, the aisles there for weeks. The jelly beans, the Cadbury eggs, and all of the uh, appropriate uh, peeps, definitely the peeps. The, the yellow peeps are the originals, right? Yeah. What's in here? We still have some in here, I think are not originals. Those are in the birthday pile list. But we get so much else wrapped up with Easter that sometimes the resurrection gets lost and sometimes even the power of the resurrection, we get distracted from, from what God has there for us. As we looked at Matthew 28, 1 through 6, and we've already read it in our scripture reading, but reading it once again, uh, we'll recognize that the power was all there. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered, saying unto the women, said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Look at the power there, that, that first resurrection morning. An earthquake. Now, earth science was my favorite science, until physics. Biology and chemistry were a distraction. Earth science and physics were my favorite science. I loved earth science. The explanation of the natural world that we live in and what we can understand of it. So plate tectonics was fun. Some of you, your eyes gets glossed over with tectonics. Other ones got excited. I saw that back there. That's like plate tectonics. That's where it's at. Plate tectonics are biblical. Because in the days, I believe it's of Eber, the, the, the world was divided I think is what the, the Bible talks about. And plate tectonics are the moving of the plates on top of the earth, the earth's crust around, and and how the, the shifting of the uh, continents and all of that takes place. That stuff is exciting to me. That is interesting to me. And plate tectonics explain lots of things in our world. Volcanoes. The rising of mountains where plates are coming together the sinking of seas, all of those things deal with plate tectonics. And earthquakes are the proof that the plates are moving. 
because as the plates move, they don't move slowly over time, not like sliding your hand across a, a, a silk sheet. It's more like rubbing your hand across a gravel driveway. <laughs> okay, you can have a glove on your hand. Abby's up here flinching. That as you, you rub, it kind of gets caught and goes and caught and goes. And that's what happens with the plates, that as tension builds enough to overcome the static friction between two pieces of land, they shift. And and that static friction's overcome and they slide, causing the earth to move. And say, so, Pastor, why are we having an earth science lesson? Aside from the fact that you're a science nut and you love science, that's that's not the only reason. That's where earthquakes come from. Very convenient. That as the women went to the tomb, that plates right near where the tomb was decided to shift. See, or that's where earthquakes come from, but that's not where all earthquakes come from. This earthquake did not come from the gradual buildup of pressure between two plates. I suppose it could have, but to try to get an earthquake to happen at a certain time is quite the act of God. Uh, because people do try to make earthquakes happen. So why would people want to make earthquakes happen? Because out in California, they talk about the next big one. Well, what? why the next big one? Because the San Andreas Fault is so long that so much tension can build up that when there's a big one, massive destruction can take place. So if they can make a smaller earthquake and get the plates to shift in a smaller amount, they can have a smaller earthquake that does less damage. Now, I guess God is big enough, wise enough, smart enough, and powerful enough that he could have had those plates tensioned just right to at just the right time give. But an earthquake, and an earthquake just caused by God at the right time. The stone was rolled away. And I always loved the explanation that the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let people in to see that he wasn't there. So there's an earthquake and the stone was rolled away and an angel comes down from heaven, which as we know from other examples where an angel comes down from heaven and speaks to man is a true display of power. The power was all there that first morning. Earthquake, angel rolling away the stone, power, glory, fear. It was all there. And today it's been replaced by bunnies and eggs and, and uh, pastel colors. Now, I did see a Facebook post this morning, I will not say Happy Easter, because it's not Easter, it's Resurrection Day. Like, okay, but we need to understand the world we live in, that the world out there, when they hear Easter, they think that's that church holiday. <laughs> so Easter's not a bad name. But what we do with Easter, Easter eggs, Easter baskets are fine. My parents gave them to us when we were kids, my younger brother enjoyed most of the chocolate out of his one Easter morning. We had a rule in our house. You find your Easter basket, you get one piece of candy. And I think he devoured everything that was chocolate in his and then came upstairs with chocolate all over his face. Was it wrong? No, wasn't wrong. But it's wrong if we distract ourselves so much from what actually happened that we lose the focus on it. We lose the focus that when we, we deal with the Christian holidays. There's one Christian holiday that God tells us to celebrate. You know which one that is? The death of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. It doesn't say gather around a tree and give each other presents for my birthday. It doesn't say eat lots of candy for my resurrection, but we're to remember his death. But as we remember his resurrection, we ought to remember it in the right light. The power of the resurrection. Is that power from almost 2,000 years ago, one and done? That it's once, it's over, it's forgotten? Or is it still at work today? What started out almost 2,000 years ago as a very dark weekend for the disciples, for the followers of Christ, to see him die on the cross and, and to see their hope die with it. We don't have much picture of what happened on Saturday in the Bible. 
But I can imagine that was not a fun time for the church, was not a fun time for the disciples, was not a fun time for the followers of Christ as they tried to regroup. And they didn't sit around on Saturday from what we can understand of Scripture and try to figure out how to explain this away. Well, you know, we need to get our best PR people out there and explain this in the best way we can. They didn't know what to do. Well, the disciples stole the body of Jesus. The disciples were scared. They didn't know what to do. It started off as a dark, sad, and powerless weekend, ended with power, the news of which spread quickly to the, the gardeners, to the women, to the disciples, to over 500 people at once. That news spread to religious and political leaders. The religious leaders trying to get a cap on what went on and like, whoa, I thought we had a stop to this on uh, when we crucified him. And, and, and now how are we going to tamp this down that the body's missing? And the, the civil leaders. Well, listen, all that you just told us, that's a fantastic story. But listen, we'll pay you. Just tell people that the disciples stole the body. The news spread quickly in all areas without TV, without Internet, without cell phones news spread quickly of what had happened but is it still there today turn with me to, to mark chapter 12 i hope i remember that mark is before luke mark chapter 12 verse 24 and this is jesus speaking and this is Jesus speaking before he died on the cross and before he rose again, but speaking about resurrection power as they were arguing over whether there was a resurrection of the dead. Because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And so the Sadducees came to Jesus with this question. The question was, of course, Master, if, if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind, and so he takes his wife's, his brother's wife to his wife and then dies, and there's seven brothers, and they're all married to this woman, and the seventh one dies. Eventually, the wife dies as well. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? <laughs> we got Jesus now. <laughs> He's not going to say that this woman's married to seven men in the resurrection. Resurrection, what a silly idea the resurrection is. And Jesus' answer, verse 24, Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scripture, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise. Have ye not read in the book of Moses how the, in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. The power of the resurrection is the power of God. And that power is the same yesterday, the same today, and the same tomorrow. That same power. You say, well, yeah, but when's the last time you saw a resurrection? Well, just this morning I saw a, a, a movie clip or what's it called, promo, for a Pure Flix movie about the girl that believes in miracles and she resurrected a bird because she prayed for it. I'm really now curious about the movie to see. I was waiting for the based on a true story to show up. There was a, there was a, a bird and there was a dog. There was a lame boy that got to walk again. Um, it's the power of the resurrection still around today. God's power is the same. The power of the resurrection is the power of God. So what power does the resurrection have today? What should we expect? Because Jesus rose from the dead, what should we expect from God's power? First, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Because of the resurrection, we have the power to change lives. You might think, well, how glorious is that next to the power of someone coming back from the dead? But 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What power does a resurrection have today? 
The Power to Change Lives. There's a former drug addict that lives here in Jamestown that loves giving his testimony of how God's changed his life. His, his brain is fried from the, the amount of drugs he took. Uh, and he tells stories of when he was on drugs that he used his infant child to help hide drugs or smuggle drugs or get drugs and um, complete mess of a life that he had before Christ. And in talking to him, he, he doesn't quote scripture very well. He has the idea, but he told me, I can't memorize scripture word for word. I, my brain is so fried, I can't get it out. He goes, I, I've worked hard at verses and they just won't come. But he can tell you what's in there. He can tell you what's in the Bible. He gives you if you want to get him word for word, you'll he'll get like a twenty percent on a on, on a memory verse. But he'll give all the praise and honor and glory to God for a changed life, and the fact that he hasn't touched drugs in years, because God changed his life, the power to change a life, and and working with teens, an interesting thing that. Uh, with teens that if you uh, actually it's it's just teens are more vocal about it us adults think the same thing sometimes too we see a glorious testimony you know the uh, the cross and the switchblade oh uh, yeah someone saved out of gangs in New York City and the wonderful testimony they have and boy I wish I had killed someone then I'd have a really good testimony a testimony of a changed life is a changed life you don't have to be super, super depraved by man's standard to be depraved in the need of a savior. God's power to change life. I remember the one in the 90s was, or maybe it was the 2000s, the, uh, the surfer, Bethany, that had her arm bit off by a shark. I remember a, a kid telling me, man, I don't have a cool testimony because my arm wasn't bit off by a shark. Like, I feel so bad for you. Um, <laughs> She has a wonderful testimony now, and she still has both of her arms. The power to change lives. We look at what Paul says there. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The power to change a life. I believe there's, there's two parts to that being in Christ. When we accept Christ as our Savior, the Bible declares us to be in Christ. So is everything new and everything different as soon as we're in Christ? In the eyes of God it is. There's that part where, where God has declared us righteous because of what Christ has done on the cross. And when he looks at us, he doesn't see the sinful being that we are, but he sees his son because his son's blood has washed us from all of our sins. He sees who we will be when the process of sanctification and glorification is done in us. And when we are in Christ, we are a new creature. You notice some of those old habits come back, though, sometimes? So, well, if I'm a new creature, why do I still struggle with this? Why, why do I still struggle with eating? I, I don't struggle with eating. I really enjoy eating. That's the problem. Because all things in moderation, that my eating is a problem. And even though I've given up chocolate now for, I don't know how long that's been, there was those mini chocolate chips I had in a granola bar that I wasn't thinking about after running a race. If you count those, I'm, I'm back up to about five or six weeks of no chocolate. Does that mean my eating habits are perfect? No, it means I find a lot more places to get sugar from that don't taste as good as chocolate. Well, why aren't you perfect yet? Well, it's the side of glory. But is there power there to change a life? I could say, well, I'm in Christ, so therefore in God's eyes I'm perfect, and I have been perfected already in his eyes. But what about the sin that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, if we read that verse again, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's that picture that in Christ, in salvation, I am a new creature. In God's eyes, I'm a new creature. But also when I walk in, in Christ, I become a new creature. The old things are passing away. 
Walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, that's not in Christ, that's in the Spirit. Well, yes, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all one. So walking in Christ, walking in the Holy Spirit, is walking in the Godhead. And when I am in Christ, I am a new creature. That, that verse talks about salvation. When we're saved, we're in Christ, we're a new creature. But it also talks about sanctification. As we walk in Christ, we become a new creature. That power of the resurrection is still at work as we walk in Christ. Living in Christ is tapping into that resurrection power for today. So, well, yeah, but can I tap into it and bring someone back to the, from, from the death, from death? Well, it's, it's a whole lot bigger of a deal to change a life. Romans chapter 6, that power to change lives. Paul again talks about in Romans that picture of the resurrection, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall uh, be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now I'd say, well, well hey, but... I that's only if you've been baptized. Well, that baptism he's talking about is pictured by water baptism. The baptism he's talking about is the baptism of salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That we are, when we're saved, we're baptized with Christ into his death and raised to walk in newness of life. That's a picture of salvation. That Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is pictured by the new life that he gives. Our lives after salvation, picture the resurrection power, the power to overcome sins in our lives. But not just the power to change lives, power to change our life, the power to change the lives of, around us. We may look and say, well, there's not any hope for them. Really? The power that brought Jesus back from the dead can change any life. We might not think so. Uh, but God's not worried. God's not sitting up there going, oh, man, if so-and-so prays a prayer for salvation, I don't know what I'll do with them. If so-and-so, there's nothing God, I, God, I'm going to be able to do. No. God, the power of the resurrection is the power to change a life for anyone who believes. Secondly, the power of the resurrection gives us the power to forgive. Might even be on the same page there, Romans chapter 4, or across the page from where we were in Romans 6. Romans chapter 4, verse 24. Paul says, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Delivered for our offenses. Why did Jesus die on the cross? So that God could forgive us of our sins. Wait, God couldn't forgive us without Jesus dying on the cross? No, he couldn't. So I thought God could do anything he wanted to. Well, that's a lie. God can't do anything he wants to. Well, actually, he can do anything he wants to. He can do anything consistent with his character. God cannot sin. Well, I thought God can do anything. I can't sin. Which means he can't lie. Which means he has to uphold his holy standard. He cannot forgive mankind without the penalty being paid. So, well, he's the God of the universe. Can't he just wipe it away? If he could have, he would have. But he made the standard that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And we only have enough blood to die for our own sins. And once we die for our own sins, it's over. There's no life left. The only way was for a perfect man, the perfect God-man, to die for our sins. And because of the resurrection power, there's power to forgive. Power for God to forgive us. The power for us to know that we can be forgiven. The power for 
anyone to know that they can be forgiven. It won't take long in life for you to talk to someone about the gospel, for you to hear someone say, God could never forgive me. And you know what they're saying? They're saying, I can't even forgive myself for what I've done. I can't forgive myself for the wrong that I've done. And so as I picture God, he can't be any better or any more powerful than I am. And so God couldn't possibly forgive me either. Well, when someone says, God couldn't possibly forgive me, you have God's permission to let them know that they are wrong. Well, who is God unable to forgive? Humanly speaking, God's able to forgive anyone. That's why it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God doesn't say, Let them submit an application and we'll see. Let them submit an application and then after a period of time where I observe them and see if they can get their act cleaned up enough, we'll talk. Now, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The resurrection power is a power to forgive. And that comes with a hook for us as well. You know, it's not just a matter of, great, we can be forgiven, but that is a matter for us. That's a big matter for us. Because how often does Satan whisper that lie in our ears that you've, you're a bad person? Yes, I am. But I'm a bad person that's forgiven. Now, Satan will come along and say, does God really forgive you? Because you've asked his forgiveness for that more times than you can count. Is God still going to forgive you another time? Yes. Well, how many times is he going to do it? 70 times 7? You know, if that was the limit, we'd all be out of luck. It goes beyond there. I suppose we could probably take Abraham's promise there that he forgives us as many as the sands, the grains of sand on the seashore, as many of the stars in the heaven, innumerable. Like, well, we can count how many stands, grains of sand there are. Yeah. But the picture, innumerable. The power to forgive. But it's also the power for us to forgive others. That resurrection power is what empowers us to forgive others. As we hold on to grudges, we're ignoring that power that's available because Ephesians 4.32, I better get this one right because most of the kids know this one, right? Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That picture of God's forgiveness of us is how we ought to forgive one another, how we ought to forgive others. That power comes from the power of the resurrection. Because if we weren't forgiven, we wouldn't be able to forgive. If we are forgiven, we should be able to forgive. So, well, you don't understand what they've done to me. I don't have to. I don't understand the power of God in all its completeness, but I understand that the power of God is enough to forgive. There are some deep hurts. There's likely some deep hurts in this room that, that we, we might wonder, well, I don't know if I could really use the word forgive to explain how I feel about them. The power of the resurrection means we have the power to forgive. Not forgiving is like drinking poison and hoping the other person gets hurt by it. We have the power to forgive the power to share it by forgiving others. And one more from Ephesians uh, chapter 1, the power for hope and glory. We're not heading to the verse where uh, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But sometimes we think this is all there is to it, what we have now. We lose focus of that. It's like we lose focus of the resurrection of Christ and the power that was on display. And it's all about spring flowers. And I love the spring flowers. I love the pastel colors. I have a deep and abiding love for chocolate and all things chocolate and caramel and egg shaped that's chocolate. Um, but we need to enjoy those things and not lose focus. The power for hope and glory. Ephesians 1 chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 17 
Paul, as he is pray, talking about his prayers for the Ephesian believers, says that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The power of the resurrection is the same power, Paul says, that God is working toward us word today. And Paul prays that their understanding would be enlightened to know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That we would know the hope of his calling. What's God called us to? Well, I got my, my get out of hell free card. I'm good. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty poor view of what God's called us to. His calling's far greater than that. But that calling that he's given, we can't fulfill on our own. We can't work hard enough to get it done. We can't do it. But God's exceeding great power is shown, shown in the resurrection of Jesus is his power working in us. The hope and glory tied to our inheritance a grand inheritance, not measurable in dollars and cents. I don't know, I heard this week that the dollar is about to collapse again. And anyone else hear that? You're, we're all supposed to be buying gold and silver now. Like, uh, fortunately, my inheritance is not tied up in dollars or rupees or yen or I don't know what other currencies are out there that are supposed to be so... Oh. Lira? No, Lira's gone, isn't it? That's Italy. It's now uh, the Euro. That's what it is. I should get that one in there. That one's a pretty major one. The Euro. Our inheritance isn't tied to that. The glory of our inheritance. We look at inheritance as, well, I can't wait until I receive The glory of God's inheritance that he has set in store for us is far better than a house, a car, uh, a big pile of cash, a big pile of gold. Uh, in fact, it includes a big pile of gold. You know, streets are paved with gold. There's the power to provide the future he's promised, but also the power to fulfill his calling. The power to fulfill his calling means encouragement for believers. We might look at what God's called us to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. Say, well, that's a pretty big task. I, I don't know where to start with that. Well, we need to start by tapping into God's power. He's at work to us, word, who believe. The power to fulfill his calling isn't resting in how much smarts we have, how much strength we have, how much wisdom we have. It's resting in his power working through us. The power for the res of the resurrection is the power we have today for hope and glory. Comfort and assurance in what's to come. Is there a home in heaven? Yes. Is it worth it? Yes. Well, how do we know it's worth it? The power that's at work to assure our inheritance is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It doesn't seem to me that there's a limit there. The power to fulfill his calling is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. So what can stop it? What can stop us from fulfilling his calling? Well, I suppose if I died, Really? How many saints have actually been used of God to accomplish more through their death than they ever saw accomplished during their life? 
why would God use that that way? Because God isn't limited in that way. His power at work, the power to change lives. We can't look at anyone and say they can't be changed. The power to forgive. We can't look at anything and say, I can't be forgiven for that. I messed up big time. I can't believe it. God can forgive. They messed up big time. I'll never forgive them. Well, we don't understand the power of the resurrection then. And when we look at what God's called us to, whether it's in this life or whether it's our inheritance, he's got the power, the power of the resurrection to provide what he's promised. I know there is power in the blood is more of a Good Friday communion hymn than an Easter hymn. But the power of the resurrection, the power of the blood, it's all God's power working together. We're going to close this morning with hymn number 191. There's power in the blood. One hundred ninety-one. There's power in the blood. When you find it, let's stand together. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you? Father, we pray this morning that as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, that we would understand that power in his blood to forgive, that power to be raised from the dead is still at work today. The power to change our life, the power to forgive, the power to allow us to forgive others. And Father, the power to do your service as you call us to the power to provide the home in heaven that you've promised. We pray, Father, that it would give us comfort, that it would give us encouragement, that it would give us boldness to do what you've called us to do. And we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.